How long is a second? I mean, why is it that exact duration? To understand this, we need two separate lectures. Stay with me. First things first, the second is the base unit of time, just like the meter is for length, the kilogram for weight, and so on. As we saw in the other video, the Earth's orbit is elliptical, and this has created obstacles for timekeeping devices. Let's take it from the top. I mean, the beginning. Before clocks were invented, people measured the passage of days using shadow clocks and observing how the stars moved across the night sky. With no artificial light, humans of this period regarded day and night as two opposing realms instead of parts of the same day. Around the 20th century BC, Sumerians had developed the sexagesimal or base 60 number system that the Babylonians used to make astronomical observations. Note that this is happening before the invention of the telescope. Although the base 10 system is dominant today, the 60 base system holds plenty of benefits for timekeeping because it has so many divisors. The minute and the second were originally subdivisions of a degree, invented primarily to create a geographical system of the Earth. These are lines of latitude and longitude. The minute hand didn't make its way into the face of a clock until the mid 20th century due to increased accuracy required by astronomers. As it turns out however, it was the Earth itself that wasn't sufficient to be the world's timekeeper. Earthquakes, moving glaciers and tides, even you and me living on it creates obstacles for precise measurements. These changes are microscopic, but they do read, so for GPS and satellites they're not accurate enough. Also, the Earth's spin is slowing down. Ephemeris time was the first dynamic timescale in history. These were annual almanacs with predictions of celestial bodies' orbital positions. Today, these estimations serve as backup solutions to GPS data. Time, and the second in particular, was now defined from a single law of gravity. In other words, measured against the year. You might be thinking though, since we're even bringing this up, that a year isn't consistent in length either, because the universe isn't consistent. We discussed sidereal time and solar time in the other video, but those are only the means to measure. Sidereal time is more accurate because it's measured with respect to far away stars, and stars, from the point of view of the Earth, appear as fixed points. Solar time, on the other hand, has wider appeal on Earth because of the sun's position in the sky, endless the seasons, and all of human culture. As it turns out though, the orbit is precessing, and this means that no two reference points will ever be the same. Astronomers knew about this problem, but the changes were small, and time wasn't as central in life back then as it is today, and the tropical year of 1900 was agreed upon. The other, perhaps more obvious problem was that, if time was now defined from almanacs, however accurate, how do you plan to run a clock against the body in outer space? A clock primarily consists of an oscillator and a counter. The oscillator needs to perform a repeating action at a constant rate, and the counter keeps track of how many cycles have passed. Mechanical and spring-powered clocks, for example, though better than the sundials and eclipsiders, would need calibration when drifting off. The pendulum clock came in 1656 and was accurate to less than one minute in a day. Later that very same year, less than 10 seconds. Exactly what the oscillator might be is in theory irrelevant as long as the rate is consistent, but as we are about to find out, the faster the more accurate. The high note on a violin, in regular room temperature, plays at 440 Hz. But it would need to stay like that until the end of time. And we'd need to aim a little bit higher than 440. Quartz crystal was tested out, and they do exist, but the universe has it that any sample from the same material will still resonate at slightly different frequencies. This has a logical explanation, but it requires a few more lectures, so for now the search landed on atomic clocks. 
Measuring atomic transitions was already suggested in 1879 by James Clerk Maxwell and William Thomson, aka Lord Kelvin. Their research would indicate that any one of the same atom would be identical in any physical property and make him perfect for keeping track of time. The only problem was that technology wasn't there just yet, for which we need lecture number 2. The observable universe is large beyond imagination, and everything it consists of is tiny particles called atoms. Hence atomic clocks. To put this to scale, a drop of water contains 5 sextillion atoms, and so tiny particles here means really, really tiny. The atom is the smallest unit of regular matter that is still recognizable as the matter. It was the Greek philosopher Democritus who came up with the theory that matter eventually cannot be cut in half anymore. This theory was dismissed by Aristotle because he was convinced that matter is made out of natural elements. In 1803, John Dalton would either discover or rediscover that matter is made out of smaller things indeed. His strong experience with gases enabled him to measure the atomic weights and conclude that elements must have different properties. This increased scientists' interest for atomic theory, both how atoms can be structured to create different things, and then in turn Maxwell and Kelvin's theory. Fast forward another 50 years, and we now know that the atom is made out of protons, neutrons, and electrons, each with its own history and electric charge. Research in this field keeps going to date, but it's not relevant for this film. The discovery of the electron being a negatively charged particle set a benchmark in atomic theory, because it meant there had to be a positive charge somewhere. Otherwise, the atom would collapse, and life as we know it wouldn't exist. This led to J.J. Thompson winning the Nobel Prize in 1906. If you caught the footnote in episode 1, both the meter and the second are defined for measuring light, because light is a universal constant, as in, the universe. It also comes in a range of frequencies, some of which we can see. Invisible light then, if you will, can still be detected. In atomic clocks, cesium-133 is the standard because it's heavy, at least for an atom, stable, it's easy to melt, and its outermost electron is alone, which, for all intents and purposes, is the only one interacting with the nucleus. This interaction is called spin, except spin is a bit of a historical misfortune because of mathematical similarities. In quantum mechanics, spin is associated with a dipole moment, or magnet. This electrically charged particle would naturally align with the nucleus, and this would be their spin. So, Spin gets a bit complicated, but all you need to know is that they can either attract or repel. Back to measurements. An oscillator is an object whose motion can be plotted, because unlike the other units, one cannot make a physical second. Instead, we can subject the matter using microwaves tuned just right for the atom to get excited. The difference between spin up and spin down then is a burst of energy whose frequency is possible to measure. And by the time 9 billion, 192,631,770 oscillations have occurred, one second has passed. To this day, that is the definition of a second. In 2013, Optical atomic clocks was proven better than the atomic one by around 100,000 times. This improvement have no impact on you and me, but scientists uses them to search for dark energy and dark matter, but that is for sure another story for another time. So going full circle, I know this has been a lot of information, but if you are still here, you hopefully have a bit more insight in the history of timekeeping. We have got our second and 60 of those goes into a minute and 60 minute into one hour because of the base 60 number system. A day on the other hand is only 24 hours because math and reality don't go hand in hand as well as we want. In fact, 365 isn't divisible by 60 either, but really what the issue is, is that the number of day-night cycles going to a year is not a whole one. 
A tropical year is longer than 365 day-night cycles by almost 6 hours. This problem was attempted to solve by adding a day to February every 4 years like the Julian calendar did, and now the leap year is 366 days long. But even this puts split the difference 10 minutes short just in the other direction. 10 minutes over a long enough period of time adds up, and the Gregorian calendar we use today will skip that leap year every 100 years unless… unless the year is divisible by 400. So 1900 and 2100 aren't leap years, while 2000 is. Or was. For everything else there is time zones and daylight saving time within them at different locations at different times. But we'll have to save that for next. Thanks for watching.